Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we're pleased to welcome Monica Blazinski. Monica is a research scientist and adjunct professor at the University of Denver, where she works in material science and um, polymers. So welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'm just going to start with all the kind of issues we have with um, road salt. So okay. um, we dump over 20 million tons um, of road salt a year. And this comes usually in the form of sodium chloride, which is the same type of salt we put on our table, you know, to salt our fries. Um, but road salt itself is a less refined version. Um, so it's not as um, pure. So there's other trace minerals in there. And so it's cheaper. And when we do that, essentially what we're doing is we're lowering, lowering the freezing point of water. And basically what happens is these, um, the salt itself, um, sodium chloride goes into the ion forms. So you have sodium and chlorine ions, um, and they basically um, inhibit and prevent the um, formation of ice. Because ice is a, um, creates this crystalline form. So it, it gets in there and it, um, basically kind of keeps the water molecules um, at some distance for a longer period of time. And there's all different types of um, road salt that we can use. There's sodium chloride, there's calcium chloride, um, potassium and magnesium chloride. And really the difference is sodium chloride is cheaper um, and it also works at kind of higher temperatures. So usually on like a snowy day um, when it's just right around freezing, um, you'll see cities um, and the trucks going out and dumping this all over the roads. When it gets a lot colder though, um, usually they'll switch over to like potassium and calcium chloride. Magnesium chloride, especially more effective kind of at lower um, temperatures. But all that being said, we're spreading a lot of this stuff and it works. Um, it keeps um, kind of ice from forming. It kind of lengthens the um, time that um, ice can form and um, kind of keeps a lot of snow off the road so you can, you can drive on them. The issue with that is, is that these compounds, these chloride um, compounds, specifically these chlorine ions are very toxic and we're mining these um, road salts, sodium chloride especially, we're mining these and we're distributing them all over the country and there's multitude kind of effects um, that happen. And these are environmental effects. Um, they're also um, like in industrial, they're um, infrastructure problems that happen. And just to kind of go briefly, um, kind of give, just to give a synopsis, um, of all the kind of damage that, that can occur. Um, so a lot of the times when road salt is kind of spread on the roads, it usually washes down as the snow melt, it kind of goes into um, storm drains. But a lot of it kind of accumulates in low lying areas. When cars drive by, it kind of sprays onto trees and grass. And what ends up happening is the plants um, and animals and kind of all those different um, kind of species that are next to the road are basically being um, affected by all the road salt. And this means that a lot of different problems can occur. Um, plants can be um, extremely damaged um, when salt um, is in the soil. Basically what happens is it changes the osmotic pressure of the soil. And what that means is that um, the root system of plants and trees um, can't take on, take, can't uptake water. And plants need water to survive. But the problem is that plants don't make salt um, and they don't use salt really in their um, systems. They have no need for it. So um, it's actually preventing plants from um, uptaking water and a lot of nutrients. So what ends up happening is you have these plants, they're essentially dehydrated. Um, and that's um, what we call physiological drought. And what ends up happening is you'll see a lot of trees kind of on the side of the highway um, actually be um, more brown than others. And that's actually the effect of salt. And you usually don't see that until about springtime when kind of buds form, you start to see um, you know, 
nature spring back to life. And you see that certain areas um, are, have died off or a little bit more brown. And so we have that um, issue. We also have the issue with, um, and when salt trickles down into lakes and streams and ponds, especially stagnant water. And what ends up happening is all the fish, um, all the animals, um, even plant life there is really affected by salt. These are freshwater systems. And once salt gets in there, it's really hard to get it out. <clears throat> so the, sometimes there's this um, idea that the salt just kind of like trickles down and um, dissolves or dilutes. But the problem is that we've been spreading salt on our roads for so long since about the 1950s is that we have a bioaccumulation of salt um, in, our, in our environment, in our um, aquatic systems, which means that fish have a hard, harder time um, spawning. You have amphibians um, that can't, you know, have a harder time reproducing. And so you have a decrease in actual um, plant life, animal life, and anywhere that the salt gets into. And so it's a major problem um, from an environmental standpoint, because we can't just go in and remove the salt. And what I mean by that is our groundwater is actually becoming saltier. Um, so it's not just the plants and animals, it's affecting us too. So anybody with high blood pressure is going to be affected um, by drinking this because when salt gets into the lakes and streams, we also rely on that water too. We rely on fresh water um, from our lakes and streams um, so that we can drink it. And that becomes a problem because a lot of our wastewater treatment um, facilities are really good at removing um, like certain large particles um, or um, any sort of contaminants. But to remove salt is extremely costly. It's extremely expensive. Um, and we can't just do that all the time. Um, we can, we're really good at um, desalination plants um, in certain areas of the country that depend on it, but those are expensive. And we can't just desalinate our lakes and streams because we would take out everything else, all the other um, back, microflora, all the bacteria, all the little microorganisms that um, ecosystems depend on. So we can't use um, any sort of reverse osmosis, which is the technology needed to actually extract the salt. So what we have is a kind of major problem because everything is um, kind of accumulating, all the salt is accumulating over time. Um, there are, of course, other problems. Um, we have alternatives to road salt, but they each kind of come with their own problems. Um, so we have de-icing fluids. So propylene glycol um, is sprayed on planes and it's safe, it's non-toxic. Um, sometimes we put it into food. So it's perfectly safe for humans. The problem is that there's certain additives that are added to that de-icing fluid. Um, and those additives are very toxic um, for the environment. And propylene glycol itself um, will actually cause deoxygenation um, of freshwater systems. And so um, animals, fish will have a harder time actually being able to uptake oxygen um, in freshwater systems if propylene glycol gets in there. So we can't really just use propylene glycol you know, on our roads um, as an alternative to, um, to salt because it comes with its own problems. It's also a lot more expensive, which is why we use it for planes because it's really effective um, short term, but um, there's, it comes with its own problems. There's other alternatives um, that have a lot of scientists have come up with, one of which is um, beet sugar, beet juice, um, but we're simply replacing salt, road salt with sugar. And the problem is with that is it helps to, again, um, lower the freezing temperature of water. But what ends up happening is bacteria really likes sugar. So anytime you spread this into the in ecosystem, to the environment, you're going to have a lot of problems with um, these effects that happen. Sugar will um, kind of allow other species that we don't want um, to feed on it. And of course, that will create problems as well. We don't want to add sugar to, to the environment. So there's a lot of um, kind of different issues with road salt here and the alternatives. So 
what we've been um, looking into is seeing how nature solves this problem. So there's different species um, of um, insects and plants and fish that you'll see here. Um, so there's different beetles, there's worms, um, moths, um, different um, plants and different fish. And what they all have in common is that they all produce their own antifreeze. And this is really incredible because what it means is that it gives them an evolutionary adaptation, this advantage where they can survive um, freezing conditions. And when you can do that um, as an insect or as a fish, that means you, you can survive cold water, you're not gonna freeze. Um, but it also means you can travel longer distances to find food, to forage for food or sur simply survive um, throughout the winter, which gives you an evolutionary adaptation. So a lot of insects over long periods of time, a lot of fish have created their own antifreeze so that they don't freeze. Um, so their blood doesn't freeze. And one of which is really fascinating is the Antarctic cod, um, which is also known as the Antarctic toothfish. And it's a species of fish that lives um, in the really cold waters um, off the coast of Antarctica. And in that water, um, it's really cold. And sometimes that water even goes below freezing. And that's how cold it is. So these fish have to survive in very harsh environments and in water that's below freezing. So if they want to survive in that, they have to make sure that their own kind of bodies and their blood doesn't freeze. And so they produce um, what is called an antifreeze protein. So when it gets really cold, these fish will actually produce these proteins, these large molecules that will actually bind with ice. And so when that happens, the um, fish is able to prevent kind of that crystallization that happens. Because when water freezes, it creates this very intricate um, crystal. And so what they're able to do is actually prevent that from happening. So I'm showing just a couple of examples of different antifreeze um, proteins. And these are really big molecules. And these are polymers. And what polymers are is um, molecules, large, large molecules that are made up of small little parts. And usually these are repeating little parts, what we call MERS. So polymer means many parts. So these are proteins that um, are very, very large, very um, long and complex. But when it comes down to it, all they're really doing is they're binding with a portion of the ice and preventing it from getting bigger. So we've been trying to figure out exactly how all these different antifreeze proteins work. And there's all different types. Each um, insect, each kind of fish or plant creates their own. And so there's different um, ways that they kind of have evolved to um, create these proteins that bind and they bind in different ways, but they all do the same thing. They prevent ice from getting um, bigger, from expanding and crystallizing. So what we have, um, what we've done, what we're interested in, what I'm looking into is exactly how does um, the Antarctic cod prevent um, ice from forming. And looking at the, these large kind of molecules, these large proteins, they look really complex. But when we look at them um, kind of as a molecule itself, um, what we're really I find interesting is that it's only certain atoms um, that are actually doing all of the work. So I've highlighted here um, in arrows what exactly, which portions we're actually interested in. So it looks complex, but it's actually um, just a few um, atoms that are doing the hard work. So these um, specific areas are the ones that bind to ice. So these are what we call ice binding compounds and they're made up of oxygen and hydrogen. And water is oxygen and hydrogen. So two hydrogens, one oxygen, H2O. And what we find is that these compounds will actually align with um, water molecules. They'll actually create a hydrogen bond. And when they do that, they actually can prevent water from creating this crystalline form. So that's great, but 
unfortunately, we can't put antifreeze compounds on the road. Um, one of which, uh, one of the reasons why is that the proteins, these antifreeze proteins that fish and insects produce are very delicate. So um, putting them on the road wouldn't um, be very effective because um, they would denature. And what that means is basically they would be destroyed by the sunlight um, or the outside environment very, very quickly. So they wouldn't work if we put them on the road. So one solution to that is to create our syn a synthetic alternative. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to recreate what the Antarctic um, toothfish does and create our own version that is um, that will survive um, long enough on the roads to actually be effective. And the idea behind this is that um, a compound, a synthetic compound, would be non-toxic, it would last longer, and it wouldn't have the detrimental damaging effects of salt um, or like propylene glycol. And so it would be safe for the environment and it would be safe for us. So one solution that we found um, is that a polymer and this large molecule by the name of polyvinyl alcohol is very, very similar to the, um, the protein, antifreeze protein of the Antarctic toothfish and a lot of other ones. And it contains those same atoms that we were looking for, these same compounds and oxygens and hydrogens. And it's got a lot of them on its um, very long um, kind of chain. And because of that, it's able to attach itself to ice and do the same thing. So what we found is that having the synthetic alternative um, allows us to actually create um, this biomimetic version of antifreeze that you find um, in the Antarctic toothfish. <clears throat> so we've been running a whole different variety of computer simulations to find out how this works. And what we found is that when we simulate um, the, ice, the crystallization of water in a computer, we find that on its own, it'll crystallize pretty quickly. But when we add, for example, the, um, the antifreeze um, proteins, the ice, the water doesn't freeze. So the water doesn't freeze when we have um, these antifreeze proteins in contact with water. And when we add polyvinyl alcohol, we find that it also doesn't freeze. It stays as water um, in these simulations. And what Is we find- is, is there a threshold? Does it just never freeze or, or have you tested like, does, could it ever eventually get cold enough that it would freeze? So good question. Um, so what we found is that it's at certain temperatures and at certain concentrations. And what we found is that only certain variations of polyvinyl alcohol will actually create this effect that pre prevents or delays um, this crystallization of ice or of water. So um, we have to have um, a certain structure with um, polyvinyl alcohol. And that structure has to be very, very similar to these antifreeze proteins. Um, and that's because these oxygen and hydrogens, they're called hydroxyl groups. And these are the groups that we're primarily interested in um, for both compounds. And what we find is that if they're not in the exact orientation that we need, they don't do anything. So um, yes, so we, we um, have to have certain um, kind of um, concentration and we have to have a certain temperature range um, below um, kind of about 20 degrees um, below zero, um, that's Celsius, it's not effective. Um, and what we know is um, from computer simulations, but we're also seeing this when we're doing experiments in the lab. We're finding that below a certain temperature, they're not effective. And we are trying to figure out why that is exactly. Um, and that goes for both. There are limits to how, um, how well these compounds can actually prevent um, kind of crystallization or ice nucleation. I, I realize you're, you're uh, making like a synthetic thing from nature. Uh, but so will this break down where the salt's not and the salt's more of a contaminant? Right, so salt um, has these chlorine ions that are extremely damaging. 
and that's primarily what causes the, the problems. The advantage with our synthetic kind of version, polyvinyl alcohol, is that when it breaks down, it breaks down into non-toxic um, components. And we actually use polyvinyl alcohol in a lot of our products today. So um, sometimes you'll see those um, like detergent pods. Um, those a lot of the times will use polyvinyl alcohol, so they will dissolve in water. So we already use these. We use these in um, cosmetics, and like skincare, um, in, in certain products. Um, and polyvinyl alcohol is safe. Um, and we found that it breaks down, but it breaks down um, and it doesn't affect the environment, doesn't affect fish. And it breaks down slowly enough that it's effective, but also it's able to actually break down into components that um, do not affect the oxygen, for example, um, levels of fresh water, um, and it's non-toxic to fish. So, so yeah. Okay. So I guess my next question is going to be the economic side of it. Um, is that going to be a, a hurdle then? Is that a barrier or these, these inex this inexpensive enough that uh, it still could be feasibly economic for cities to use? That's a good question. And the reality is that we have to be able to produce this at a cost that will be comparable, um, not necessarily to road salt, um, sodium chloride, because it is just so cheap. But for example, to propylene glycol, if it can be cheaper than that, which is fairly expensive, it can range from like a thousand to two thousand dollars a ton. And you know, whereas road salt is like 50, <laughs> um, it, we have to get it below that. So we need to get as close as possible. Um, and there's ways to do that. It's just simply economics of scale to get this into mass production. Um, we do produce this. We already have the infrastructure to produce and it's produced on a fairly large scale because we use it in all these different products. Um, so it would be a matter of getting it below that, that threshold. In the statistic that you gave us uh, early on with the amount of salt that was used, was that um, like in the US? What was its scale for that? Mm -hmm. That was in the United States. So the 20, 20 ton, million tons, 20 million tons, that's in the United States alone. Um, and it causes um, over $22 million in damage um, to just our cars. So it's damaging not just to our environment, it's also damaging our infrastructure. So salt is really kind of corrosive. Um, it's toxic to, to fish and aquatic life, but it's also um, really kind of toxic in a sense to our roads, our bridges, and our cars, because that chlorine ion is so reactive that it will cause um, corrosion and degradation of anything that has metal and anything that is concrete too. Um, it actually changes the chemistry of concrete. Um, so all our infrastructure that is concrete um, is affected by it. And so sometimes you'll see like bits and pieces um, kind of concrete falling off um, rebar. That's that metal um, mesh that's put into concrete. And you'll see it kind of break apart. And that's the corrosion that happens a lot of the times due to salt. Um, so it's really, really costly and it costs a lot of money to repair all these structures, to repair our cars. And then on top of that, we have the environmental consequences. So um, to go back to your question, it's, it may be simply um, a long-term kind of cost that we need to build into this. Will it be cheaper in the long run to use a, a little bit more expensive um, alternative to road salt, but that will save us so much money um, in, in infrastructure costs and repairs and the damage that it causes to our environment, which is irreparable. It, it's just, wow, I mean, you we hear of like plastic, you know, being toxic for the environment. We're finding, of course, before it was just like the greatest thing ever. And so we started using it. And like you said, since the 50s, we've been using salt on roads, but never would have thought about it being a contaminant within the environment too. Because I mean, it's like, you know, hey, we dig that stuff up, you know, what's it gonna hurt? But right. uh, so. exactly, exactly. That's, the, and, that's the first I had heard too, um, of it being a bio, that it's bioaccumulated as well. I never thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. 
Right. And if um, you think about like the Dead Sea, um, you know, hardly anything can live live there um, because there's just so much salt and salt. We have a very um, kind of small limit of how much salt, you know, we can um, kind of take in. Of course, we have biological systems that help us filter out salt, but we drink, you know, seawater. It, it's toxic to us. And same thing to all the plants and wildlife, you know, we kind of need a freshwater system and our, our Great Lakes are seeing this kind of road salt effect too. So just because we're spreading on the roads doesn't mean that it's not migrating to all the other ecosystems. Everything's intertwined here. So our Great Lakes are getting saltier too as a result of this, which is extremely you know, big problem because how do you get it out? Um, once it's there. It's very difficult to actually get the salt out of the environment and it tends to stick around um, and it actually will um, stick around in the, in the layer just um, right, right where groundwater tends to accumulate. So it's how do you get it out from, from our soil? And this will affect our crops too. So it's not just, um, you know, ponds and streams. Farmers will also be having, um, you know, issues with um, salt, salty soil because crops don't want to grow in soil that has too high of a level of salt. So this really affects all, you know, the aspects of our society, of our environment, um, just our world in general. So, so yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, mer mercy. It, uh, I, I learned a lot with this. <laughs> And uh, I, I know I saw uh, Sarah's eyes lighting up when you started talking chemistry. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I certainly learned a lot of this. This is just, that's just, just amazing. Um, never would have, never would have thought something as simple as salt. Well, and this is really where um, I hope that um, this also educates a lot of people because we kind of take it as this very um, kind of harmless um, you know, material. We put it on our food. And so we don't think of salt as being, you know, really detrimental. We eat it, you know, makes our food taste great. But what ends up happening is we kind of spread it on our sidewalks. We spread it on our driveways. And we have control over that. Um, we have control over, you know, telling our, um, our cities and our municipalities, um, you know, is there an issue? Because um, salting kind of our um, sidewalks and driveways, um, we need, also need to be aware that that accumulates once you have this over, you know, millions of households um, in the country. Um, that all is um, kind of on top of everything that's also being spread on the highways and roads. Um, so I hope that this also is a chance um, to kind of um, help just in a general understanding of, um, you know, what we're doing in, in this kind of a cumulative effect. And if, you know, we can just kind of decrease the amount that, you know, we're putting on our sidewalks, kind of spreading on, on our driveways, it'll help to um, reduce kind of this um, as well. And it's, Really, I just hope starts kind of getting, you know, getting us thinking about what we're doing since we don't really consider it to be um, a problem, but it's it's in the background and it's going to be um, kind of really detrimental in the future. Well, I so appreciate that because a, lo a lot of times we hear about this, I mean, did this or that, and oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's bad for our environment, but no one tells me what I can do. You know, it's like, it, it's out of my hands. So it's like, you kind of forget about it. It feels like, but uh, you're actually following up with, you know, here, here's some large scale things we're working on to replace that. But in the meantime, go ahead and lighten up for land sakes and uh, talk to the, uh, the the cities and stuff that's putting it on and see exactly. if we can't uh, reduce the amount and uh, try not to try not to kill this earth we're living on. Exactly. No, absolutely. So there's things we can all in individually do, you know, just, um, you know, give it maybe a few hours or a, an extra day if you can um, and let it maybe snow melt um, kind of just naturally. That'll help um, a lot. And just um, seeing if, you know, what we can do, but also it's um, just um, kind of a, a reminder that this is kind of a, an issue that is um, top down but we, we absolutely can. So working it 
on it in the, on the research side, but there, there's things that um, everybody can do just in, individually. So absolutely, like you said, you know, the plastic problem wasn't um, really considered an issue um, several decades ago, but thanks to a lot of education uh, and outreach, we now know, you know, the, the effect. And similar to this, it's, it's kind of same problem um, that we, we need to be aware of and um, kind of public education is really a, a large portion of that. Um, so, yeah. Well, Monica, thank you so much for joining us and uh, I think I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having me. This has yeah. been great.